Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's agency nomic session. This one is a subject we undoubtedly all feel, uh, I'd say, some familiarity with, however much we either try and ignore or pretend otherwise, uh, which is confidence. Uh, we're, we're joined by fellow community member Elliot Kay from Speaker Express, who specialises in really helping agency founders address challenges in confidence and how this directly relates to agency growth. Um, today's session is the first in three, so keep an eye out in the community for the other sessions as they all really complement each other and we'll be taking forward things we've discussed today into the next session and then the third one. Um, just a couple of operational things before I hand, hand over to Elliot. This session is 45 minutes long and we're going to try and stick to that as closely as we can. We're also going to be recording it, so if any of you do want to watch it back afterwards, feel free to contact myself or Abby uh, and we can share it with you. So um, I'm going to get going and hand over to Elliot. Uh, have a good session and we'll uh, see you in 45 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and hello. Um, have any of you attended, I think, uh, any of my previous training that I've done with Agency Noix? No? Okay, good. Well, I'll do a brief intro for myself, just so you know who is this person speaking to you. And then what I'm going to do today is really take you through what I would call seven steps to understanding having more confidence as well. By the way, uh, Krishna, are you related to Beju Solanki? Hi, no, I'm not. Sorry. <laughs> okay, because I don't see that. You, that's a surname you don't see very often. So when I saw your surname, Hello. I wonder if it's related to Beju. Anyway, just wondering. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself and we'll, we'll deep dive into confidence. The first thing I want to say that um, as we get going, that as we were talking just offline, you know, confidence is a bit like sales. Yeah, we all want more of it. Um, but very, very often what I found having worked with over a thousand entrepreneurs now in this space is often we don't stop and have a look at how we're we doing with it. We don't assess. We don't check in with ourselves. And so today I want to just give you some tools to do that, understand it. You're very welcome to have the slides. Uh, I'm not worried about my IP in any way. They're very simple slides. So, you know, I can send them to Abby who can then distribute to them. We can, you know, reach out to me direct if you want. Um, if there's anything on that resonates as well. Um, if you could just do me a favor, as I'm getting going, I'm going to start talking about myself a little bit, but I'd love, love, love you to, to put your, obviously I can see your names, but what is your business and where are you based? Because I'm really nosy. I just really like to know where people are from. Um, so if you could put that in the chat, that would be amazing while I get everything loaded up. Uh, and we'll get going with today's presentation, today's talk. So you're doing that already. Let me get going. There we are. And I'll have a quick read on them as they come through. So we're doing the hello. We've done that and where you're from. So I think what's really important to understand right now as well, when it comes to confidence and speaking, that this is a really important time in our history to really utilize connection and communities. And I think you're all part of the agency nomics community. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to confidence, I think most people I know in my space, highly, highly successful entrepreneurs, massive uh, turnover figures, big company owners and solopreneurs and small business owners have had their confidence shaken with what's been going on. And so it's a really good thing to do today is just to stop and evaluate where are you and understand how we can get more of it and understand why things affect us as well. But now is the time for you to, wherever you are right now, is to really look at how you can confidently do more of what you're doing already. So we've got Felicity in Cheltenham, Leapfrog VR, Food and Hospitality, good. Caribou Digital Software, Farnham, I used to live in Surrey before I moved to Devon, the California of the UK, by the way. Uh, isn't that true, Abby? Well, you're not, you're, you're next door, you're Dorset, right? So you're not quite California. You're more like, you know, whatever would be next to California. No, I am Devon, I am just in Devon. Oh, you are Devon, yes. California of the UK, as I call it. Great, we've got Jeremy and Newcastle up on time. We got, it's Neve, right? Am I saying that right? And London, we've got Krishna, who's not related to Beijing. Uh, Cambridge, we've got Sunny Hampshire, woohoo. And then we've got Leeds. I used to live in Leeds, Chris. I used to live right by the college up in, where did I live? God, I can't remember my address now. Anyway, by the college in town. Uh, and then we've got Kenya. Fantastic. Oh, international community. Love it. Love Leeds, by the way. If I ever has to 
I always said if I was to leave London, it would be for Leeds. But then I left London and I ended up in Surrey. And then after that, I said, if I've left Surrey, it'd be Leeds. And then I've ended up in Devon. So clearly that wasn't the case. But I love Leeds. Second home. My godson lives there. <clears throat> Another one in Leeds. There's two Leeds people. What, 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 what are the coincidences? Like, what are the chances of people from Leeds being here on the call? I love it. OK, let's keep going. Um, so just a little bit about Speaker Express. We were founded in a stinky pub in Kentish Town with very sticky floors and very smelly carpets. Anyone been to a pub like that? Not in Kentish Town, generally. Well, Chris, you live in Leeds. So I, I've been to those pubs. So I know they're there. Yes. So that's where this started. And I'm glad to say that over a decade later, we were before the pandemic, we were based in various more uh, respectable establishments. And we did talks globally. I've done talks globally. I speak globally now as we speak. And we work with a variety of industries, a variety of accelerators. We work with people to get onto Dragon's Den and pitch. We work with people to get onto Masters of Professionals and pitch themselves. So what we do is about the methodology, not about the industry. So one of my key strengths is, besides confidence, is language, structure, and impact. So how do you take what you're doing, use the right language for mass impact? What's the structure that will lead the audience to where you need to get them to arrive? That's what I should focus on. That's one of my strengths. We're a small team right now. Um, you've got my wife, who does a lot of the marketing and the data analysis. She's a market researcher by trade. The co-founder now lives in Australia, so she's not involved. And then I have a couple. I've got a community coach and Rash, uh, Regina, who is literally my right-hand person. She works with me very closely on everything, pretty much. So what is your challenge when it comes to confidence, if you can type that in the box as well? And if I can just ask, what would be really great if you could help me out is if you could keep the cameras on because that helps me draw the energy and I get to see people smiling and nodding or not smiling, but I get to see faces. It makes it a lot easier for me to, to keep my energy up and to connect. But you know, if, if you're meant to be having an affair and you're on here instead and you don't want your face to be seen, then you can come off camera. And so yeah, by all means. So that just helps me as a speaker to, to really do this. So what is your biggest challenge when it comes to speaking? I'd love to hear from you. Is it, what is it? Okay. I'm sure it's not dumb sounding. It might be monotone, I don't know. My English is my second language, so sometimes it's not called my confidence. Okay, cool, nerves, they kick in and take over, okay. Awesome, so only three people. Couple more people. Biggest challenge, keeping control in meetings. Do you mean, Jeremy, as in controlling the meeting so it stays on point, or do you mean nerves control, like inside control? You can unmute yourself if you want. Knowing what to talk. Yeah, sure, thank you. I, I was just um, frantically typing. What I mean more like is, it, is, is if you're, in discussions with a client, let's say existing client, potential new client, more about keeping on points in a way that meets with your agenda, not theirs, or finding some common middle ground so that the relationship is not one-sided from the start. And then you might get into like some kind of, I don't know, difficult precedent where, you know, it, it's not quite comfortable for you, let's say, or things aren't quite weird like them to be. That's kind of what I meant. Okay. So is that a matter of assertion being assertive and staying on point going can we just come back to it without coming across offensive or abrupt is that, is that part of it yeah I, I think originally for me it definitely was a confidence thing nowadays i would say it's more about process so okay. i need to have a rigorous you know basically a checklist that we that we go through so that um you know we're covering all the things that i want to cover you know and I suppose confidence might come into a bit where you feel like someone else has taken the lead of the conversation a bit more than you'd want. And then afterwards you think, actually, now that I think about it in that conversation, we didn't really get onto this point, or I kind of feel like we're, we're running on their agenda now, which doesn't really sit well with how we do things. So I think it's more about just having a good process in place for okay. me at least to make sure that I hope, I things get done in the right way. Great, I hope this helps you. Um, Felicity, is that fear of not being taken seriously or fear of being taken seriously? Is that an underlying imposter syndrome type thing? Uh, nerves and reverting waffling when nervous, having confidence belief. Again, Felicity, if you're happy to unmute yourself or just type in there. I just want to get clarity so I know exactly what's going on. 
Yeah, I do think it's it's about um, fear of being taken seriously um, and literally um, I'm very short and people will literally talk over me and okay. you know sometimes that's quite difficult. Okay so is it again about you asserting go can, can you not talk over me can you I want to yeah. make a point here so it's a bit yeah, of asserting. So. Well. Okay uh, okay great Thank you very much for clarifying that. All right, let's keep going. And hopefully, you know, I'm going to cover a whole range and we're going to really deep dive into confidence, the concept, but also what, what affects confidence. And then all being well, there'll be time for questions as well. Um, if by the end of this, you want to discuss anything with me, I'm going to give you a link to book a call in with me and stuff like that. So I just want to give you as much as I can as we go along. But thank you for telling me some of your challenges. Just very quickly, so you understand, I've had my own battles with confidence. Um, I've been doing this for over a decade. Uh, when I was 42, I woke up with severe depression overnight. It was literally my birthday. And uh, that lasted for months. I had real um, dark times in my life. And it actually came to a point where, you know, I was on a train to Waterloo when I was living in Surrey. Uh, actually, it's the same train that goes via Waking and, and Surrey. Um, and I sent my friend a message. I said, either I sort this out or I end my life. Uh, and my friend that I reached out to is actually very spiritual. We sat down, we did a lot of work, um, which helped me obviously not to take that path. And uh, at the time, what transpired was uh, I wasn't living on purpose. I wasn't living to my purpose in life. And therefore, there was a big gap of conflict in my head. So a lot of what I'm teaching you has come not only from my training as a cognitive behavioral hypnotherapist and a coach and NLP and emotional freedom technique practitioner, but also from what I've learned from my own experience with severe depression and how to overcome it as well. Um, that's very brief, Nutty. I just want you to understand, I don't have it now. It's all good. Um, and it's really interesting because my business was doing well. I had a, a very happy marriage. I had a beautiful girl at the time. So on the surface of thing, you think, where did it come from? Uh, and then when we dug deep, that's where it came from, from me. Just on the other side of things, so I co-founded Speaker Express. I'm an international speaker. I've written five books. My sixth one will be out this year. Um, We've offered, we offered them to the community a while back, uh, so you know I'm sure we'll do that again soon. Uh, I do have a podcast, uh, Voice for Good, and the Public Speaking Expert podcast. <coughs> Excuse me, Voice for Good season two. I did a whole season dedicated to confidence. So if anyone want to dial back to Voice for Good season two, I interviewed over 30 experts around confidence. So that's uh, if you want access to that as well. And I'm an accredited virtual speaker. Do you know what that means? It means I spent $85 to be told I can speak online. And it was $85 well spent. What can I say? What a great investment. As you said, we work with a variety of industries from tech entrepreneurs to influencers to people getting on TV to, to property investors to creatives. I've had the pleasure of working with people from Agency Nomics um, on their, their signature talk, on their pitching. And now I'm going to be working with all of you on your confidence, which makes me happy. So what we're going to cover is where does lack of confidence come from? what being unconfident can look like and what you can do to overcome the lack of confidence. So everything I'm doing, every step will have all three integrated in that. So I hope uh, you find value. And again, if you want, um, oh, that's, also, that's an old handle. It's not Elliot KPTS at all. Do not follow Elliot KPTS because it doesn't exist. Um, I thought I'd change that. Um, what was I gonna say to you? You'll find it's all integrated and please ask questions as we go along. If I don't answer it straight away, just put it in the chat and we can go from there. So the first thing I want to talk about is cognitive, as in understanding thoughts and how they affect our confidence, because they have a massive effect on us. Now, this is based on um, a study where someone dissected and looked at data for over 10,000 different cases, and they analyzed thinking patterns, effects of thoughts and everything. Again, this is based on case studies and data, not something that I pulled out, it's actually the book, which I'll give you the book in a minute. Um, it's actually the, it's, it's from a book called the, the New Mood Therapy by David Burns. And he talks about thinking errors. And maybe you do some of them, maybe you do none of them, maybe you do all of them. But really what I want you to understand, and I'm not gonna ask which one do you do? It's not that kind of session. I just want you to understand the different type of thinking that goes on and the detrimental effect that can have on us. And then after that, there's other steps as well. So, you know, all or nothing think, thinking, a lot of you will, we do this quite automatically. It's things like, uh, I'm not saying it's right by any means, and some of you don't. So please don't assume if I said it, you know, that I don't do that. And, you know, 
a lot of us do. If you go like, for example, all football, all football fans are hooligans, right? That's all or nothing, you know? That's like, everybody's the same or nobody's the same. Nobody gets me, nobody understands me. That's all or nothing thinking, right? I won't dive too much into it, but I just want you to understand. So that's a typical thinking error. Now, can you imagine what that will do on, some, on, on confidence, how that affects you, right? So if you, if you perceived yourself to be, um, you know, you can't talk or people talk over you, like you mentioned, Felicity, you're on your own, that can be all or nothing thinking. Again, that has a detrimental effect because thoughts become our reality. Thought actually affects us physically. Uh, and of course, thoughts affect our moods, right? Um, another one is overgeneralization. Um, and that's when, let's say you walk into a door and you're like, oh my, that, that I always walk into doors. Doors are always in my way. This always happens to me. Does anyone relate to that thinking? Does anyone know someone that might be do, that does that every now and then? And you just take a single thing, like you bang your head, like, oh, that's it, it's in for me. Even the house wants to beat me up, right? It's that kind of thing. I know I'm going a bit dramatic and a bit pantomime, but I, I, it's just to make a point, of course. But do you see what I'm saying? Because we all have those days, like, you know, my son, the whole of last year, and he's regressed a little bit, he's two years old now, but he woke up at four o'clock, you know, went for this whole year of waking up at four o'clock in the morning. Most parents can relate to what I'm saying, unless you had an angel child who just slept through the night. Me, you know, and I just remember one day where it's been months of it and just everything kept happening, you know, like I was dropping things, I'd walk into things. I was just so tired. And I was like, oh, this always happens to me. Everything's coming after me, you know, that kind of, oh. Yeah, so be aware of that, overgeneralization. Mental filter. You will know lots of people that do this. I'm not saying you do, but you always see the negative. Not you, 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 but I'm just using that, right? Do you know anyone like that? Does anyone know anyone that always sees the negative? You can go, oh my God, I've got this great idea. Look, I can prove that it will work. Like, yeah, but what about this? This won't work because this. This won't work because of this. Anyone know someone like that? Hmm. And then the other one is the opposite, is, is, is kind of, they're very close, is when they completely disqualify the positive. So one only sees negative, the other one discounts the positive. Yeah, but you know, you mentioned it could work, but it's not going to, and here's why. So they're very similar, but actually distinctly in thinking and how you'd express yourself, they're slightly different. Yeah, I'll do a check-in and I'll see how you're doing. Jumping to conclusion. How many of you do that? And you always assume the worst, right? Um, I mean, a typical, uh, a typical kind of example of this is in relationships when they haven't texted you back within a certain period of time or, you know, oh my God, they're not interested anymore. They don't care. Uh, some they're over, they're clearly with someone else by now. I mean, I'm I'm not saying that's the case here, but just to give an example, that's one that a lot of us can relate to. Um, that you're just always assuming something negative and you jump to that conclusion. So by that time that person actually contacts you, or by the time you're in that situation, you've built up such a story in your head, right? That often you overreact to something that's very minimal. So I want you to be aware of that. <laughs> that magnification and minimization, that thinking that a situation is unbearable or impossible and it's really uncomfortable, that's a big one. So it's a bit like if we take it's a little bit hot, right? You know, when it's a little bit hot temperature wise and people are like, oh my God, I'm burning here. I go, oh, I need a fan. I need to get air con, right? That's just magnifying the whole situation. It's uncomfortably warm. Yes. I mean, I'm not taking away people's individual experiences of heat, but that's an example, right? So something else. So a lot of you mentioned nerves, <coughs> nerves before getting on stage, nerves in meetings, nerves before presentations, right? What happens is it's uncomfortable. But when we look at thinking errors, what we do is go, I can't handle this. This is, this is really bad. Something's wrong with me. Um, why do I feel this way? And what we end up doing is magnifying the nerves. And then it, again, has a detrimental effect. Now, some of you might not do any of these, but I just want you to be aware of them if, in, in case you do, right? Right, emotional reasoning. Um, the reason this is a cognitive, uh, Thing. And the reason it's a thinking error is because you make decisions based on how you feel. And if you're feeling negative, the chances are that you won't make the right decision for what needs at the time. Now, it's not, I'm not talking about intuition here. I'm talking about when you're already in a down state and, you know, you decide to do something which will be counterproductive. And the way you, you, you rationally goes, well, it just feels that way. And that can be dangerous. Not looking at any data, 
not looking at anything substantial. Um, obviously, when you're feeling good and you make good decisions, you, you, you tend to make really good decisions. But have you noticed you make really bad decisions when you're down? And I just want you to bring the awareness of this as well. Shoulding. Anyone know shoulding? People that should all over themselves, right? I should do this. I should do this. I should be, you know, I should be better. I should be taller. I should be wiser. I should be cleverer. My voice should be better, right? Um, but you can't really control it. So it's one way to self, um, def, um, what's the word I'm thinking? Self-destruct, right? Because you can't control all of the things. Oh, I should be doing what they're doing, but you're not them, right? So understanding and even pay aware, be aware of it when you listen to yourself going, I should well, what is it you you think you should be doing, right? Uh, have a have, have a consciousness to this now because actually what you want to be saying language of certainty, language of confidence is I want to. Yeah, I want to do this. I want to do that. That's that's language of confidence. Should means you're in between. You're uncertain or you're unclear. Labeling, mislabeling, right? So again. I hope not too many of us do this, but it's when we go, you know, it's the whole all men are or all women are, or, you know, it's similar to the first one. But what we do is we put a label on something and then it's very hard to shake it off, right? Once we've decided that this person is like this or I'm like this. So a lot of people define themselves as insecure, right? I am insecure or I don't have confidence. And the problem with that is the moment you've labeled yourself that, your brain will work very hard to justify that thinking. And then it will start to show you why you aren't or why you are what you say you are. So that's the danger with labeling and mislabeling. Of course, mislabeling is dangerous for discriminative purposes of ourselves as well, but also externally. So if you keep labeling yourself as a nervous speaker uh, or someone that loses their place or, or someone that uh, goes wrong or someone that's not confident, then your brain will justify why it's true. And then it's very hard to take that label away, right? And the last one is personalization and, and blame. Uh, and that's when it's, you know, when we in, in, take it inside and it's my fault because something went wrong. It's my fault because of the performance. Just, you know, because Jeremy uh, gave the example, Jeremy, it's my fault because it's my fault that the conversation didn't stay on track because I don't have a process. Therefore, I must be a really bad person. I'm not saying that's what Jamie's saying, by the way. But you see that kind of, that, that thought spiral it creates. Yeah. So again, I just want you all to be very aware of these things because thinking is a huge part of what creates and breaks confidence. And if you're aware of these different thinking errors, then you can catch yourself and have coping mechanisms to do that as well. And again, it's from the New Mood Therapy by David Birds. For those of you who really want to dive in, explains how we arrived at these different thinking errors and of course what to do about them. How are we doing so far, people? I know it's, it's deep, deep stuff, but are we okay? Any thoughts? Give me like a yay in the chat if you're okay and you're still with me, you're, you're, you're getting stuff, just give me a yay or, a or something. And I'll keep going, there's six more steps and then all good, still here, good. That's a good start. I'm seeing some smiling faces. Yes, all good. Woohoo. Good, good, good. Yes. Okay. Well, I just want to keep checking in on you people because I know some of you, I don't know where this thing. Oh, I even get a smiley face from Chris. There we go. That's awesome. All good. Okay. Let's keep going then. And then hopefully there will also be time for questions. But are some of you getting a little bit of, oh, aha. Oh, ooh, okay. Now I'm explaining something. Oh, I know someone like that really well. Right. <coughs> I know someone like that really well too. That's why they're not in my sphere anymore. The other thing I want us to, to think about when it comes to confidence and how to deal with confidence and how to have more confidence is this, right? From a very young age, we've been taught that judgment is bad uh, and we should avoid it. And, you know, it's not a pleasant experience. I'm not going to pretend that it is. I'm not going to say, oh my God, you know, everything's okay. That's delusional right? We're all in industries that come to mass judgment and can come at you in, in many ways. The thing is to accept that judgment is part of the process. Judgment is part of our everyday existence. And the more we can accept judgment will come and judgment will be there, actually the easiest to welcome love. 
And what do I mean by welcome love? <coughs> I mean, things like accepting compliments, uh, celebrating our successes, uh, allowing ourselves to go, well done, that was okay. Allowing yourself to go, that was an okay presentation. Because what most people do, they walk out and go, that was terrible. I was so bad. No, that was awful, right? Well, that's self-judgment. And that's often not true. There's things you could have improved, maybe. Yes, I don't know, because I haven't seen a lot of your styles. But just understanding that judgment is part of the process. So when I worked with Philly, who went on MasterChef Professional a couple of years ago, uh, she came in the top four, the only woman to come in the top four. Mm -hmm. um, she came in the top four, by the way, because of her cooking, not because of my training. Just, I mean, I'd like to say it's because of my training, but she got on there because of her training, right? Because she was young and she's up against like a thousand top, top chefs and Part of what we worked on was positioning. How does she position herself in a way that stands above the rest? And I did say to Phil, I said, Phil, you've got to understand that once you step into that limelight, you've got to accept the judgment is going to come at you, right? Because it will. You'll get lots of love. You'll equally get lots of, you know, not love. And we worked a lot on acceptance, that judgment is part of the process. And if we try and avoid that, if we try and fight that, if we try and go, no, 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 or we equally beat ourselves up with judgment, then um, then actually it affects our confidence. I need to drop over. Okay, cool. No worry, Virginia. Yeah, so I just wanted to be aware of that. When I say welcome, love, I mean, you can take it for what that means to you, but it means acceptance. It means allowing yourself some credit, knowing that you're doing a good job, self-compassion, something I talked about today. I'm on Clubhouse every day, pretty much. And as you know, people talking about coping strategies and one of the greatest coping strategies when it comes to confidence, self-compassion. It's okay. You're human. You know, you're all business owners, entrepreneurs. You all do things. You want great stuff for yourselves. It's not an easy, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. Therefore, you've got to, you know, have some self-compassion. That in itself will help your confidence as well. Third thing, very few people define what the confidence themselves is, looks like, feels like, sounds like, walks like. And most people are very busy defining what the unconfident version looks like. So uh, another way to rebuilding confidence, so we talk about thinking errors, we talk about judgment as well, is to define what the confident you looks like. So Felicity, if, uh, let's say, have you ever defined the you that doesn't allow people to talk of them? I'm, I'm just using you because you use an example, right? Very few people actually sit there and go, well, the confident me looks like this, sounds like this, speaks like this, physically holds themselves like this. And when you can do that, what happens is, again, remember what I said, if we think it, our brain works very hard to justify. And a lot of you will know this because I know a lot of you in the kind of the hacking, the brain hacking and all that kind of stuff space, right? It will look to justify it, right? Now, what people underestimate is how long it takes to become it, right? Because it doesn't happen immediately or very quickly, a lot of people give up on that. Oh, uh, I guess I'm not, I'm not destined to be this way. It's not... It's not me, which isn't true. It just could take a bit longer before you become that confident you. But unless you define what that confident you is, how do you know who and what to become, you see? And so this is an integral step of having more confidence. You know, I did this years, years ago when I used to coach. Um, I was working with someone, I don't do relationship stuff, but this person particularly wanted to work on that at the time. And I said, okay, define the you that's in a relationship. And she wrote this whole description of herself in a relationship. And then she wrote this whole thing about who she wanted to attract. And then a few months later, she attracted that person and became that person, right? Because it was defined and therefore there was a focal point to evolve into. And that's what I want to, everyone to understand that, you know, for what you put as the challenges here and things like that, nerves, reverting, waffling when I'm nervous, well, if I take the example, you know, Chris, sit there and write, what does the confidence speaker in you look like, sound like? How do they hold themselves? Things like that. I'm just using, because I pick, you know, I can see your example here. Very few of us take the time out to actually define what that looks like, feels like, sounds like. Yeah. So that's a really important part. There's various exercises you can do around it if you wanted to do. Uh, the other thing, of course, to do about it, if you're unsure, is something, some of you probably know modeling, right? You'll know modeling is where you go, oh, that is exactly what I want to look and sound like. And you model them, right? You model what they're doing and their, their tone, how they speak, how they stand, 
And that, that's from neuro-linguistic programming where you model excellence. And that's a great way to build confidence if you're not quite sure. Well, I really like how, um, and I, I, I wanna choose someone who's not controversial here in the, in the press. Um, I really like how, well, I guess whoever I choose, I really like Oprah, right? I like how Oprah speaks. I like how she holds herself. I like uh, how she talks. I like how articulate she is. And so what you do is you model her behavior to become that confident you. Yeah, good stuff, people. Are we okay, still with me? Yeah, good. I'm hoping all these heads down because you're taking notes, not like, you know, on TikTok and, you know, things like that. If you're on TikTok, that's cool. Follow me. I'm Elliot K. if you want. I do do some dancing on it, but mainly public speaking stuff, right? The other thing is step four then, look, once you've identified the confident you, what that's going to do is highlight the insecurities of achieving it. So really what can be very important is working with someone to collapse the insecurities around that. So it could be, you know, a counselor, it could be a coach, it could be a psychologist, whatever it is. Again, depends how extreme it is for you, not everybody but really working on collapsing those insecurities, which allow you to step into the confident you. And there's various tools and techniques and there's various people to work with, right? It's not, you know, I don't necessarily do the whole collapsing stuff when I work with them on their confidence. What I do do work with people is, is, is retweaking their thinking patterns uh, to be more confident, but collapse the insecurities and there's various ways to do it. it. It can be done fairly quickly, obviously depending on the severity of it. I have a coach. I've been working, you know, I always have a coach, I have mentors. And one of the things we always work with when I work with my coach, when I'm looking to step up, launch stuff, you know, is we work on the insecurities around and we collapse them. Doesn't mean it will always work out, but I feel a lot more confident about pursuing that path. So that's step four. Step five is live your values, right? And I don't know if, uh, again, I'm not sure a lot of you have done personal value work, more than I don't know. But what's very important from a confidence point of view is to truly live your values daily. Why is that important? Because when we're living to our highest values and what really matters to us, it gives us a different level of certainty. Now, what a lot of people do is they either live to what they think their values are or they live other people's values, right? So if I, if I was to do an exercise around values, I'd say, what are your values? A lot of you say honesty and uh, integrity and things like that, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But when I deep dive and do value work with people, actually I find out they're driven by very different things than honesty, integrity. Those are kind of your, your givens, but there's other things. You might be driven by fun and you might be driven by adventure. Like that might be one of your top values. And unless you're living to that, it means you're living your low values, which means it's dark and it's uncertain because you're forcing yourself to live to that, to those what you think are the values. So if you've never done values work, please do. The big change for me from moving out of depression was living to my highest values every single day, which means there's a different level of certainty, which means there's a different level of confidence. If you want to really, someone that talks incredibly I, I, my, my, my grammar went completely wrong there. Someone's incredible who talks about values is someone called Dr. John Demartini, right? Google him. Google Dr. Jim, Jim, Dr. Jim, Dr. John Demartini and values. The way he explains values is incredible. How do you know if you're living to your highest values or not? It's you always have time, money, space, and energy for what's in your highest values, right? I'll give you an example. Long day at work, right? Someone says to you, um, do you fancy going to the cinema, right? If you're really tired and it's not in your highest values, be like, no, this is a very simple example. I'm too tired. But if, someone, but if you really valued, let's say, uh, adventure or you valued physical exercise and someone says, do you want to go climbing at the, the climbing arena? Like, yep, yeah, boom. Suddenly you've got the time, you've got the energy, you've got the space, right? And you've got the money for it. Like, yep, yeah, I'm in, let me do this, boom. Like someone says to me, Elliot, should we go for a run? I'm like, cool, let's go. No matter how tired I am, right? Because I love running so much. So I just want you to understand that by living to your highest values, it breeds a layer of confidence that can be unshakable because you're living to your truth, which is a different thing. Another great book, by the way, when it comes to confidence and under understanding things is a book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. 
And he talks about something called the upper limit. And it's really, really worth listening to or reading as well. So um, that's a book called The Upper Limit. I know The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Okay. Game changer for me, for many people as well. I should be promoting my books. I'm not going to. Step six. I'm sure you've heard of this. I'm sure you've heard of Simon Sinek. You know, uh, start with the why. Uh, that's a big driver of confidence. And I'll tell you what it is. Just because you're connected to your, you know, when you're connected to a big why, a bit like your values, then your level of certainty and confidence has a different layer to it. However, the reason this is in here when it comes to confidence, when you're committed to something bigger than you, then actually your desire to deal with the obstacles is greater because you're part of something bigger than you. And that could be your family, by the way. It doesn't have to be a Gandhi type big why or something like that. But it just gives yourself that commitment to, to go beyond you. Because if we go, if we're just committed to ourselves, it's easier to self-destruct. It's easier to not deal with things. But it's like, no, this is about that, right? Again, a typical extreme example is people like, you know, when you find out someone's really ill, you're like, oh my God, I need to raise that money for that person. And you do everything to make sure they get that money because you know that their health is at stake, right? I've just witnessed this with my, my friends. They've just done exactly that, something bigger, right? Therefore, the level of confidence and where they operate from is, is a different space. For me, my big why is really simple, to be a great dad, to be a great husband, and to serve entrepreneurs globally. That drives me every single day, right? That also, when things are going wrong and I'm having cash flow issues, that also gives me my own challenges because suddenly I don't feel like I'm fulfilling my big why, which is where collapsing the insecurities comes in, right? Last step before we wrap up is you've got to just take ownership of who you are and who you want to be, right? And again, there's ways of doing that. If you do the other six steps, it gives you ownership of your identity, right? So those are the seven steps. I believe there's a recap here very quickly, and I hope you've got some insights. I mean, this is one of three of these um, as well, but master your thinking would be the flip. So we, ended, we talked about speaking errors, but if we can master our thinking, we're more than halfway towards being more confident. Accepting judgment, allowing love, again, defining what our successful confident us looks like, feels like, sounds like, operates like, collapsing insecurity on a regular basis. And we all have them. We all have them, right? Live your values. There should be an S there, live your value, right? If you live to your highest values, then again, there's another layer of confidence and committing to something bigger, really, really, gives you much more ability and scope to want to be confident in what you do and own your identity, own who you are right now. It's okay, right? Whoever you are now is perfect, right? Own who you want to be as well and start moving towards it. So those are the seven steps um, I wanted to share with you. And that wraps up today's presentation. Uh, I purposely wanted to leave a few minutes for questions as well. Uh, here we go. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. I've got to nip off a few minutes early. Cool. Apologies. Have to run. No problem. All of you. Uh, so yeah, any questions about anything I flagged, anything I raised, anything I discussed, um, any aha moments whatsoever, put your, put your hand up or put your hand up. Just unmute yourself and ask the question. We've got five more minutes before I need to deliver a masterclass for three hours. Yay. Uh, in, in the chat is my Calendly. Right. If any of you want to book a call and go deeper with anything I discussed, I flagged, I raised, feel free to, to book a call in with me. I'd love to chat to you. Any questions about anything I raised, discussed? Confidently asking me a question. Okay. So what was your biggest kind of takeaway as we go a few minutes? What was your big aha or something like, oh, uh, you can type it in or unmute yourself. See you later, Will. Thanks, Krishna. So I guess, you me. Yes. I guess the biggest takeaway is the language we use dictates of how we feel and how we make the others feel. And if we use positive language, we not stitching ourselves up, basically. And if we use negative language, it could affect everything going forward since we use it. So I guess that's the biggest takeaway we need to bear in mind of what language we use and yeah, that dictates and it, how we feel. 
Yeah, absolutely. And just on that note, it's not always about it being positive, right? And like, oh, no, everything's okay. Like you're falling apart. It's just being really mindful to what we're saying, what we're saying to ourselves uh, and how we're communicating. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matt. Cool. If you need to jump off, jump off. I'm good. Any other insights or aha moments or anything you want to share? I can share this. Thank you for the session. Um, uh, I never thought about or never tried to just imagine or define how a confident nightmare would look like. I think that was quite interesting. Yeah, there you go. There's your, there's your little task. <laughs> to really sit there and, and for yourself, you don't have to post it and you don't have to do it. You know, it's for you to really sit there and go, okay, what would I look like, sound like, think like, how would I, you know, and really take the time. And if you weren't, I don't know if you're into vision stuff, but then after that, you can take that and turn that, put that onto a vision board, which you see every day. But start with just defining what the confident you looks like. I, yeah. I'd, you know, if you fancy letting me know, like sending me what, what, what you've done, I'd love to read it. But Thank you. Yeah, good. All right, one more before I hand it back to Dan and, and or Abby. Who else like to share a, an aha or something that they realized? No, quiet, quiet. Blown away by my awesomeness. Like, oh, just kind of lovely to see you, Elliot. Yeah, you too, Matt. I need to go to another meeting. Good luck with your meeting. Uh, see you soon. Thanks so much. It's probably okay. a good time there, Elliot, to to hold it, hold it there. And uh, thanks, thanks for sharing all the insight. I hope everyone found it valuable, beneficial, and gave you some interesting things to think about um, and, and start applying. Next session, as Elliot said, is on the seventeenth of Feb at midday, uh, and this one's going to cover and continue on from you know what Elliot's outlined today. It's building confidence to speak and sell, uh, how to deliver talks in team meetings arguably personally for me, the, the hardest type of speaking, um, and using the right language to make an impact. So. Uh, a kind of natural continuation from from what's been discussed today. Uh, thank you all very much. Have a good day and we'll see you in the next one.